Hello and welcome. You're watching India Today, India Tomorrow, the program that interviews families across generations and gives you a chance to look into their lives, share their stories and share their incredible magic. And today I have with me a truly incredible father and son combination, one of India's greatest industrialists, Rahul Bajaj, and his exceptional son, Sanjeev. And I warn you, he's inherited a lot of his father's Midas touch. Welcome to the program, both of you. Thank nice you. Nice to be here. Rahul Sahib, I gather that people don't quite realize that you come from a truly exceptional family. Your grandfather, Jamnalal Bajaj, was virtually a fifth son for Mahatma Gandhi. In the 20s, your family burnt its western clothes and took to Khadi. And in the 30s and 40s, your grandparents, parents, uncles and aunts were all in jail one by one for the freedom movement. How did you end up the best known face of Indian capitalism? I couldn't have given myself more compliments than this. Than your colleagues have done great research. <laughs> but how did you end up the face of capitalism with such a nationalistic background behind you? You've already answered, uh, Karan, the second part of your question about the nationalistic background. Jamna Lalji, my grandfather, my dada, was considered the fifth son of Mahatma Gandhi. He brought Mahatma Gandhi from Sabarmati, where he came from South Africa in 1915, in the early 30s, to Varda. Only Jamna Lalji. There's no other reason why. Gandhi shifted, he was resisting, and that's the story as to why he ultimately had to shift. So would Jamna Dalji have liked the idea that his grandson is perhaps the best known capitalist today, or would he have been a little embarrassed very by difficult your for success? me to imagine that, and where it's natural for me to say yes to that question, but don't forget, we were a business family. In the 20s, what businesses one had? Ginning, pressing, money lending. If you were a Northeast, maybe you were a tea garden, or jute, or nothing else. In fact, during his lifetime, we started the, we bought a steel company, which became Mukund, and we started the sugar. Except that you were more than just a business family, because if I recall correctly, in your early years, you lived in Vardha, where Gandhiji's famous ashram was, and for the first eight years of your life, you didn't actually have a formal schooling. What sort of life were those first eight years? I remember going to a Hindi medium school for maybe less than a year, when I was six years old or something, in Vardha. But my, of course, like my father's was entirely that, but my education was in Sevagram, which is our property, and my grandfather gave it to Gandhiji for his ashram, where Bapu Kutir and everything else is there. So to go there, and I was too young to realize what was happening, and then Vinoba's ashram in a place near Vardha, also given by my father, grandfather, called Ponar. Gandhiji considered Vinoba Bhave as his guru. So the spirit of nationalism was literally imbued in you as a child? Absolutely. That's, it's, and I can't take any credit for that. It's just inborn. Your school was very different to your father's. At that stage of time when you went to school, your parents were in Akurdi setting up Bajaj Auto, and they sent you the same school as all the other employees of the company went to. But it was a conference school run by Swiss Jesuits. Was it fun? It was actually great fun. You see, growing up in that school, as you very correctly said, most of these students, their parents either or fathers mostly, uh, went to one of the factories around here. So if it wasn't Bajaj Auto, it was Thermax, Tata Motors, one of these. Or they were small businessmen, small traders. But the school had tremendous discipline. We studied together, played together. I knew no better. But when I look back today, I think the grounding that that brought in, those years that brought in, nothing else could replace that. And that's why my kids, so that school became full and uh, we sponsored and set up another school run by the same society called the Kamal Nain Bajaj School, about 10 minutes away from that school. My kids grew up in that school. My daughter graduated last year and my son is still there. There's a lovely story from the days when you were school. I gather that you were required to go in the colony bus like everyone else. But one day when you were late, you suddenly discovered the family car was at your disposal and then you tried to make a habit of going late to go in the car until your father found out. So that was a great story, a great lesson actually. Uh, yeah, we went by the school bus like everybody else in the colony. We stayed in the company colony and uh, the school was just a 10 minute drive. What, and this is my brother Rajiv, my younger sister Sunaina, three of us. So one day, woke up maybe a little late and missed the school bus and my mom sent us in the family car which used to be an ambassador car I remember those days. My sister was very sida but Rajiv and I must have thought in the evening that let's wake up 15 minutes late tomorrow. Did that, 
again the school bus went because we had to walk up to the bus stop uh, about a five minute walk but you had to walk bus went again went by the car we did this for three or four days obviously either my father realized or my mother told him one day we woke up in the morning i think the fourth day and there was no car and we were late and we were told we had to walk to school so there was one of our staff who accompanied us for a 30 minute walk to school but more than the walk our school was very strict so to reach class after class had started was exceedingly embarrassing you can be sure that didn't happen again. So after that, you made a point, you're going to wake up on time and you're going to catch the bus. Absolutely. Now, when you finished school at Cathedral, you deliberately opted to go to college in Delhi. You went to St. Stephen's. You've told people officially you did it because you wanted to experience life in a hostel. You sure you weren't trying to get away from home and become independent before your time? Well, the two are linked, but no, there were two reasons. And I've always said it publicly from day one. If I had gone to Bom Bombay College, it would have been Elphinstone because I wanted to do economics. And it would have been the same thing. No good hospital, fa hospital facilities, I would have gone from home. But St. Stephen's was you know, equally well known, if not in some ways better college. So you wanted freedom from mummy and daddy? Okay, you can put it that way. More mummy. <laughs> that time, daddy was in parliament for three terms. He was traveling all the time. He was very tough, very tough. Mummy was the disciplinarian. Absolutely. But my main reason was also another one. There are two reasons. If you went to Bombay University, four years to graduate. Those days, we got teen sal ka gaya. If you went to Delhi University, you start next June, you graduate in three years. So you were saving one year? Uh, that was my, started with that main. But this was also important to stay in the hostel. But in fact, in Delhi University, it seems that you had a ball. You were one of two students who had a scooter. You were out all day and often all night. And I'm told frequently you would creep back at one o'clock and have to jump the gate because the gates were officially locked. How do you know all this? It's very dangerous. So it's true, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's not every evening that it happened. Uh, uh, we were supposedly doing some work and some studies, but we were staying in the hostel and I had a scooter. so. I remember in Connaught Circus, not Connaught Place, Connaught Circus area, there was a nightclub known at that time, 50s, as Palace Heights. Does that ring a bell? No. Uh, Palace Heights. And you were one of the great patrons who was there well, every no, night. No, no, I mean, <laughs> no, no. But, and I twice had to, because 12 o'clock the gates would close. So we had to jump over. Unlike what he's saying of himself, when you first started out in life, he gave you some excellent advice, which is very different to what he practiced. He said, do what you want to do, but remember, you have to be the best in the world. Mm -hmm. When you heard that, did you see it as liberating or did you see it as intimidating? When I think about that, uh, Karan, is I actually realized that it ended up being very encouraging. Because there were no expectations to say that you need to go into business or you need to do X, Y, Z. Maybe there were some internal uh, hopes, but we were never told for once that uh, you would automatically get into Bajaj Auto. Instead, on a number of occasions at the dining table, he had, in some conversation when we were still in school, said that only the best people will manage the company. And both did the engineering, passed out with distinction in first class both with a three-year gap we and three you're a gap. proud dad even today aren't you I won't admit it in front of him <laughs> <laughs> but the disciplinarian was my mother day to day because we hardly saw him but, but obviously the background she kept him informed at times it may not be every little thing naturally um, but yes they were both very strict but we didn't see his discipline till later years it was my mom. Now your first job, Mr. Bajaj, was as a trainee at Mukund Steel. You began day at 8.30 in the morning. You were often working till 9 at night. But when you went to your dad and said, can I have a car? He said, absolutely not. Do you remember that? No question of remembering it. <laughs> that was a tough, tough time. My first training after economic honors in St. Stephen's was for two years in Bajaj Electrical. That office was in South Bombay. So I did, my, I did in those two years my law degree. I've got a, a little bit law degree. I took my sanad after that from Government Law College, which was in Churchgate, from where it was five minutes to uh, go to the uh, Bajaj Electrical's office. But now this should not be on record, but um, will be on record that half the time all of us were sitting in the coffee shop next door to the Government Law College and proxy se chalta tha. You tender. carried on the habits of St. Stephen's even in your first job. St. Stephen's and later on Harvard Business School, 100% attendance. 
सेंसिटिव है हंड्रेड परसेंट बाद में मस्ती but come back to this lovely story about going to your dad and saying i want a car i have to get to work at 8:30 so i don't come back my two years of bajaj electricals now i have to go to kurla now it's in kalbe there's no kurla mukund establishment to kurla is earlier and we were staying in carmichael road i don't know your viewers will know this or not it's in kambala hill next to malaba hill today from there to go to kurla would take one hour or more so you must have been absolutely so heartbroken when your dad said no Heartbroken, I mean, it was. I don't know. Heartbroken is. I don't know. Is that? I don't know what kind of word it is. I mean, I said, "What's wrong? I want a car to go to work. I'm not going to a party." He said, "No car." And you know what happened? You go on a scooter. My mother said, "No scooter. You go by bus." <laughs> that time, I said to mom, "That listen, I'm not going by bus because you're change in between, and that's crazy. So I'm going to just." Please, your we are scooter manufacturers. Now, you know, that time we had not formally started making scooters, but I said you can't say this is risky. I'm going by scooter, so I went all those two years by scooter. So I came back by scooter. Your first job wasn't with a, with a family company. You actually chose to be an apprentice with Tata Steel. Why didn't you join a family Tata company? Tata Motors. Was it Tata Motors? My yeah. apologies. Why did you join Tata Motors and not a family company? So actually, you see, Karan, it wasn't even my first job. As part of my college engineering degree, uh, we had an option to take a course where we spent two terms. We spent a whole year in a company. and people went to bajaj auto people went to tata motors i chose to go to tata motors at that time and that was here in pune and the reasons were simple one i knew i could always go to bajaj auto later i wasn't sure tata motors would take me later <laughs> because of the name just yeah the name or whatever but that i'm saying it jokingly maybe you not have qualified to be admitted depending on how i did in my final year engineering right which touch what i did okay then um so it was just to get another exposure another experience the second was that we were getting graded for this so the back of my mind i was very clear that i had to get graded on merit and i'm sure in bajaj auto also it would be on merit but everybody my friend circle at least could pull my leg tomorrow absolutely there'd be greater credibility with a good grade from tata motors and it was a great experience as well yo real career i'm told began when you began working with bajaj auto in 1965 and you were absolutely determined that you had to come and live beside the factory in akurdi near pune now it wasn't a house as grand as the one you live in today i'm told it was a much smaller house and frequently you and had to contend with snakes not only that it was a very small house which grew gradually because it was on company property in the factory colony so it was built in a place where we had 4 5 acres of land so every time you made a bit of profit the house got an extra room there's no connection with that but <laughs> we always did well every time the family grew with every child a new room well not exactly like that but we because it has to be modular the, the house can't expand uh, improperly what about the snakes did they also decide to occupy equally frequently <laughs> but equally importantly staying in a colony meant and the house had to reflect this today it is a bigger house you are staying in a factory colony and those times even now those times the factory was working three shifts and the boss seven had to be to on site and all you are the on time right 24/7 365 5 i don't want to be an absolute landlord i remember a day it was mid 60s so late 60s we were a strike main main strike was that time only only once and we handled it hopefully fairly but firmly and so we didn't have it again in this company here 79. we had something later on 79 okay okay 79 and i remember second shift ended the third shift is starting the third shift was a small one second was a big one like first and second was same size so midnight a couple of thousand people came in my compound and uh, शौरी कवे लड़के लेंगे हमारी मांगे लड़के लेंगे हमारी मांगे एंड सो आई केम आउट एंड माई वन लेडी सर्वेंट पास्ट अवे वेरी ओल्ड वेरी वीक एंड वेरी ओल्ड शी पिक स्टिक फ्रॉम समवेयर वन वुड ब्लो शी वुड फ्लाई अवे बट यू सो लॉयल आई केम आउट शी सब अब भर मत जाइए पर आई से नो दे आर माई कोलीग्स वेंट आउट laughed and looked at them the leaders came and i said ladke to dekhiye mere se aapko kuch nahi milne wala hai 
प्यार से मांगोगे तो सब कुछ मिलेगा प्यार से मांगोगे तो जो मिलेगा और अपने दो साइड में है सीक्रेट ऑफ राहुल बजाज मैनेजिंग डिफिकल्ट कंपनी रिलेशन फर्मनेस बट कंसिडरेशन एंड फेयरनेस वेरी इंपोर्ट कंसिडरेशन कंपैशन फेयरनेस एंड वी टू हैव वेरी हार्ड नेगोशिएशन बट नेवर वुड आई से एनी थिंग विच वुड हर्ट देम हियर Is that a policy that you follow now that you're running your own companies? Fairness, but firmness. Absolutely. In 1961, you got married to Rupa Golap, the daughter of an ICS officer, and I'm told it was the first love marriage in the Bajaj family. It was the first, and I'll come to that love marriage in the entire industrial community of Marwadis and Rajasthanis. You mean no Marwadi had a love marriage before that? No Marwadi means no industrial. I can't talk of any man on the street. The audience, no large house. The audience how, is going to be saying, "Poor how, Marwari businessman." Yeah, yeah, you almost say that. <laughs> but, but it is not only the fact she, that uh, his her father was ICS and we were businessmen. Not only that, it was a love marriage. She used to say after marriage, few years after marriage, how much I have sacrificed to marry you, Rahul. I have come down. <laughs> we live in Maharashtra. She was a Maharashtrian. I'm a Rajasthani or a Marwari, a very proud Marwari, not very popular in India, maybe Ra- Ma- Maharashtrian. Second, she said she was a Brahmin. I'm a Baniya. So she kept you firmly Brahmin, in your place. And she servant. knew you are a Baniya Marwari, and you try to make money. And her father, Elty Golap. All his investment never invested a penny in the private sector equity stock. You sir, cert- securities. You may have married for love, but you certainly found your match, and you found someone who knew how to keep you in your place. Probably <laughs> the only person who did. But she was much more mature, much more sober. I mean, she gave me everything I had, apart from my ancestors. Very mature, very sober. She was a truly special person. You married for love as well, except that in your case, I'm told that you. Dated for so long and ran up such enormous telephone bills that parents on both sides were pretty eager that you should get married <laughs> quickly. <laughs> Marriage was cheaper than the phone bills you were running up. <laughs> so I got to know Shifali when we were both in college, but I was here in Pune, she was in Bombay, so through common friends, and we actually were friends for over a year before we started dating, and then we dated four years, so we knew each other five years. As we both keep kidding and saying that just shows how you can still make a mistake. But uh, dated for five years, and yes, uh, and, and I remember part of the time I was training in Tata Motors. Uh, we used to see each other alternate weeks. So uh, Thursday used to be the day off. I used to go Wednesday evening by train. Same thing. Never allowed me to take the car. Take the train, evening train to Bombay. Spend Thursday with her. Friday early morning, take a 5:30 train and go straight to Tata Motors uh, back to work. So we did that. Of course, we used the phone once in a while. And uh, in his own style, uh, one day he picked up the phone, and we had been dating now four years, and uh, talked to Shifali's uh, father, uh, Shogarware, and said, "These two are raking up uh, uh, telephone bills for both of us." And he said, "Yes, I agree with you." So we got en- so then they asked us more seriously. We said, "We are fine," uh, and we got engaged that year and got married a year later. You know, Mr. Bajaj, the world knows you today. As not just a confident and outgoing person, but a man with a thousand opinions, who's never scared to e- express them. Have you ever got into trouble because you speak too much? It's something I thought about. Was even in the family, and some close friends who can speak frankly to you, sort of make these comments and whatever words, and very frankly. But I. Some of the other, I've been lucky or whatever it is. It's again the family background and this and my own way of working. I, if I have to be honest, I never got into trouble because of that. But I do feel I'm also with age mellowing. I hope. But when I was in my thirties and forties and fifties, what you said about frank views and expressing clearly, you could say bluntly or whatever, I must have annoyed people. I must have annoyed people, and you're not telling me that with age you've learned discretion. Maybe that's another way of putting it. Another way of has he learned to dis- mellow. Has he learned discretion with age, or is he still as outspoken as he used to be, and does he still occasionally rub people up the wrong way without realizing it? 
occasionally yes clearly he there is some discretion that has come i think with age there's some mellowing that has come but we still see enough flashes of what i can't remember but as he described his 30s and 40s <laughs> and, when, and when you see those flashes are you happy or do you say oh god here he goes again depends what it's about <laughs> <laughs> so there are times when daddy can embarrass everyone it's not embarrassment uh, he has very strong views he reads so much so it's not just about general matters even at times today he will surprise us for example if you talk about the auto business that's all he did but financial services which i run is not something that's uh, uh, what he's grown up uh, looking after so and yet he, he can give you good sound advice and, and yet there is stuff that he will come up with once in a while luckily it doesn't happen too often which we've not thought about so he thinks very deeply and then he challenges you and he has a habit of challenging taking up which whatever is the position opposite to what you are taking up but as you go through it over 20 years it just makes you into a much better stronger person Absolutely. as well Absolutely he also he has a way of keeping you on your toes let's take Absolutely. a break at that point when i come back i want to turn and talk to you about business about the secret of your success but also about the odd problems that you've had to face we'll be back in a moment's time see you after the break Welcome back you're watching India today India tomorrow my guests are the incredible Rahul Bajaj and his very inspiring son Sanjeev let's talk about business Rahul you once said a successful businessman doesn't need an MBA Tata Birla Ambani didn't have one they didn't even have a college degree you said what matters is fire in the belly in other words passion is more important than book learning I don't think you can compare the things I think uh, I've said that more more often than once uh, quite often when people say is an mba required etc etc and i give those three examples of uh, gd birla jd tata and uh, dhirubhai ambani according to me without getting into means and ends and uh, ethical way of doing business or otherwise uh, those three were during the last 50 years or since the first world war the three most outstanding industrious come entrepreneurs in this country and if they could do it without an mba so Obviously, can everyone else right but MBA is a great foundation. Everybody is not those three. Life is much more competitive today. The technology, you know, you heard the word uh, 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 disruptive technology. You won't survive three years if you are not riding a curve ahead of the technology. So you not only need passion and fire in the belly. Fire you need the belly is nothing to do with business. I go by what that movie. Have you seen Amir Khan's Three Idiots? You don't you don't identify with any of the idiots do you? <laughs> Maybe many people consider me one but yes what Amir Khan said in today's competitive world if you don't have a passion for what you are doing if you don't have that fire in your belly you ain't going to reach the top before you handed over the running of Bajaj Auto to your elder son Rajiv you took it to incredible heights from a turnover of just 3 crore in 1965 it touched over 10000 crore in 2008 but what people forget is that for the 25 years that you were running it a lot of that time there was the license permit raj in india how difficult was it to contend with that system in one way and i'll tell you why very difficult for us especially and hence like for many others very frustrating and from I joined in 65 I became independently in charge from 68 and I kept doing it till at least 2000 and deep the jure till 2005 and then I handed over gradually to him and everything else went to him the financial services in those days it was license permit raj it was discretionary raj it was a corruption raj and we would not give a penny and you couldn't expand production without government permission That's even MIT if there was yeah, demand you can't produce more than license capacity your license capacity maximum you are allowed was 25% of your license capacity so being a businessman must have been an extremely no, frustrating that to experience all. that applied to everybody especially and we had become a large house by that time so because of my grandfather and father it was easier for us to maintain the thing that we will not give money uh 
that was much more acceptable to politicians coming from the way I also behaved, but most of them at that time, especially knew Jamna Lalji and Kamalanji was three-term member of parliament. Uh, so they knew that. So I didn't have that kind of pressure and request as I wouldn't name them. So many other industrialists had, large houses had. But to get things done even at bureaucracy level, the DGTD famous, Director General of Technical Development, or in getting an import license, and this and that. I mean, nothing was done without this. And we kept growing, we kept growing. But you had a terrible experience once with the minister. In the early 90s, the telecommunications minister was a man called Sukram, and he made an outlandish demand, and you had a pretty difficult time handling it. Share that story with me. Sukram, uh, whom I didn't know, I mean, except that he was a telecom minister. Perhaps he didn't know the family background, if I have to give him some credit. And uh, no outlandish demand, no. He called up and wanted a dealership for somebody recommended by him, his relative or somebody. Most people would call that outlandish, but you're being very kind. In Mandi, in Himachal Pradesh, where he came from. I subsequently found in his home four crores worth of cash notes, so we knew what kind of person he was. I'm sorry to say he's been rehabilitated probably, I don't mean any harm to him. But, so I said, yes sir, please send me the application. And uh, like we do everything in Bajaj Auto, including dealerships, uh, because life is getting very competitive, we were at that time a little bit. So we will consider that on merits. And I will tell my people who will interview these people, that other things be equal. I even said this, because it's recommended by you, we'll give it some preference. Other things be equal. He said, Mr. Bajaj, do you know whom you are talking to? I said, who, sir? I knew, but he said, I'm the minister, cabinet minister for telecom, I think he said cabinet minister, for telecommunications. I said, yes, sir, but uh, even if the prime minister rang up, the company policy will not change. You will regret that statement. I said, thank you, sir, and I very politely, I hope, put the phone down. I never heard from him afterwards. How wonderful. It's wonderful to hear of a man who bangs the phone down on a minister. I can always I imagine. I politely I put the phone down well, and bang it down. <laughs> but he thought it that way. <laughs> I can imagine the audience will think it the same way too. Now, if anything, your father's success no doubt was phenomenal, but yours has been truly in a league even beyond your dad. I gather in less than 10 years, You've taken all the Bajaj Financial Services companies to a market capitalization of over 98,000 crore. And even as I talk to, I believe it's even shot up beyond that figure and it's crossed a lakh crore. What's the secret of this incredible success? I think we have to thank somebody up there. You see, I worked in Bajaj Auto for 10 years after I came back from Harvard, so from 97 to 2007. In the first part of the last decade, we started seeing significant opportunity in financial services. We, ha we had this uh, captive financier of our motorcycles and scooters called Bajaj Finance and NBFC and two small insurance companies, one for life, one for non-life, that we had started with Allianz as a partner, a top uh, com European company. And as India was growing, and we were now growing at 9% as an economy, when we were talking internally, and Bajaj Auto was and is the flagship company of the group, but literally it was all that was the group. So we saw both as an opportunity and as a way to diversify within what we were already doing, but to make it meaningful that there was an opportunity in financial services. After having spent 10 years in Bajaj Auto, uh, though I had very little knowledge on technically insurance or lending, but uh, along with uh, an uncle of mine, Nanu Pamdani, who had spent a career in Citibank, done, I mean, done literally everything you can do in the lending space. He would have been space. the vice chairman like, like Victor Menezes, but his mother refused to shift to New York. And Big uh, sacrifice. He had recently retired, so we spoke with him. We said, can you help us build this up? And to his credit, not only did he do that, but today he helps me and together we are building Bajaj Finance and the two insurance companies as well. He lives and in a, Mumbai. Part and man. a great team. A great team. You can't do anything yourself. Great team, great opportunity, and with some luck. He's good enough to credit God or luck for some of his success. There were moments when luck deserted you, and I suppose it must have been pretty disappointing. In 87, you were very keen to buy Ashok Leyland. Yours was the better offer, but the Rover Group sold it to the Hindutas instead. Was it just bad luck, 
or was it actually upsetting as well? There's no bad luck. There's no bad luck. It was very upsetting. It was very upsetting. So it was bad play by Rova. It, no, not necessarily. It was very complicated, and I'll tell you in brief. It's a long story, but I'll tell you in brief. I knew Hinduchas then, but I know them much, much better now. All the four brothers: GPSP, Prakashan, uh, Ashok, uh, one Geneva, one Mumbai, and the two in London. We had a better means, a clearly higher offer, something around twenty-seven million pounds those days, and they they were one million pound less when it was open, and they stayed all their lives there. They knew everybody there. Contacts, I didn't know nobody. Contacts made the difference. Yes, but you see, after they got it for a year, two years, three years, people kept telling me, you know, they used to call people parties, they gave money to the Labour Party or the Conservative Party, so they've used that influence and got it. I said, listen, I don't know, but I have no evidence of that. So that's not a fair comment I will make, but the contacts, contacts obviously helped. I didn't know a soul, but what also helped was I won't name the person, I know him well, he's a very good friend, he's retired now. The top management, the chairman of the Indian, Indian chairman of the company, Ashok Leyland, Hindu just got in touch with him. And he sided with them? Yeah, they said they will, the British will always ask the present management. We will have a hands-on approach, hands-off approach. Whereas Rahul, you know, he will sit on the top of your head. No, that's what they said. And so he supported them etc etc and anyway so they got the deal this was undoubtedly bad luck as you explain it many years later in 91 when the economic reforms were being pushed through you were part of something called the Bombay Club you people had reservations about the liberalization that was happening you kept talking about a level playing field looking back 25 years later was the Bombay Club a mistake what was it a mistake what was it a mistake no the whole world is talking of that the Americans are talking of that, the British are talking, the Europeans are, everybody wants a level playing field. When they said protectionism is wrong, the sh shoe is on the other feet, the feet is on the other shoe. I mean, and what is Trump talking about? What was Bernie Sanders talking about? What is Brexit about? Globalization, globalization is not going to die. But yes, globalization didn't take care of national identity. From what I understood of the Bombay Club, because I wasn't working at that time, is we were talking about getting internal liberalization before external liberalization. If you expect us to work with our hands tied behind with all the inefficiencies and then bring in global competitors, today we are competing with competitors that are 100 times our size. But because of all the liberalization that has happened in India, and I must say the digitization of services, size today can be made up by intellect and the ability to cross boundaries using technology. That this, confidence didn't exist in 1991. Those tools didn't exist. Needed to internally liberalize. I remember in Bajaj Auto, I ran exports for four years, took it from 100,000 vehicles a year to over 600,000 vehicles a year, four years. We produced a motorcycle every 22 seconds and then it sat for three weeks at Bombay Port. How do you expect us to compete with the Hondas and Yamahas in Colombia? Transaction cost, high interest cost, everything. But I still believe, I was not trying to say that that is bad. There were a 15 member Bombay club. Messages went, not to me, somehow or the other. Even that time, the powers that be knew. When Mohan Singh was the finance minister, Montag was the economic affairs secretary, good friend of yours, asked him. They all gave me, give me gali, Manmohan Singh and Chidamna, pieces here and they refer to Bombay Club. But read what they wrote about me. So, uh, it was good. I was just bringing it to the end. Before that, Indra Gandhi was talking, R.K. Dhawan knows he's alive. I said, bring in the Hondas, bring in the Vespas, I want competition. Competition right. is the best guru that life can provide, much more than any business school. At this moment, we were But talking. give us a level playing field. At this moment. But I must admit, sorry, but I must admit that and so I would repeat that. But having said that, I mean those statements, all the 14, started by two, Harishankar Sidhani and Ashok Jain of Bennett Coleman, both good friends of mine, both unfortunately passed away. Uh, other th 12 names also I know, all kept quiet. The messages went. And you took kept the Kept talking. I was a one member Bombay club. 
And you're the one, one member of Bombay right. Club. I, I, I'm I, proud of that. I'll accept that as a perfect answer. Everyone unfairly blamed you for it because you're the only one who had the guts to stand up. All the others, when messages uh, went, I may add, quiet and skedaddled away. And I may add, unfairly or even some places, fairly. All right. They and, are right to blame me because it sounded so stupid, protectionist. That was the whole problem. The entire media made me a protectionist. And I said, bring in the Hondas and the Vespas. All right. We've gone from slightly blaming and your colleagues to blaming kept the doing very well. Let's take Proof a break. Let's Bajaj take a break. Kept doing very I well. sense the next person you're going to blame or to be politicians. Let's take a break and come back and talk about politics because you've been a politician. So was your father. And it's a field in which, who knows, one day Sanjeev might choose to venture. So we'll be back in a moment's time to talk about politics and the Bajaj family. Welcome back. You're watching India Today, India Tomorrow. And my guests are Rahul Bajaj and his incredible son, Sanjeev. You know, I want to talk about politics at this part. You've been an MP. Your father was an MP. But you know, the Indian people tend to look down upon politicians. They deride them. Are they right to do so? Or are they making a terrible mistake? No, the answer is neither, neither of those as I see it. Today, in fact, most places in the world, most countries in the world, including in India, the two vocations looked down upon are politicians and businessmen, industrialists or businessmen. Oh dear, and you've been both. I've never been a politician, as I told you in the interview which you did with me in 2006 when I entered the Raj Sabha, that I'm an independent, I'm in the upper house, I didn't fight no elections, uh, direct elections, so I'm not, and I'm an independent, so I, I can say what I want, which I did. So I was not a politician, but I was an MP and I was very much in public life. And I very much enjoyed my Raj Sabha. So uh, come back to my it. question. Should the Indian people think more highly of politicians or I are we okay in deriding the them? Pol politicians and businessmen are very necessary for any country like bureaucracy or the army or anybody else. It's the wrong politicians, the corrupt politicians and the corrupt industrialists. How can you take money unless there's somebody to give money? So that's what gives the profession a bad day. But what we mix up is the profession is good the people can be bad. People are bad. You've had a father who's been an MP, a grandfather who's been an MP. Would you ever consider politics yourself? Karan, the only thing I can tell you right now is that I'm thoroughly enjoying what I'm doing. And I have my hands full. Which is making an awful lot of money. Business, <laughs> and building some great businesses, working with some tremendous people. There's new learning every but day. But when that's life. done and over with? That's a question to be answered in the future. Ah, so the window is open. <laughs> the possibility is there. So there is, there is no great desire today, but I would never say never. Absolutely. And who knows what the future can create. Absolutely. You've known practically every, in fact, you've known every Prime Minister from Jawaharlal Nehru to Narendra Modi. And there's a story that Jawaharlal Nehru even had a role in naming you. No, he named me. There's no role. He named you. He named me. And in fact, I'm told that that was the name Indra wanted for her son. He wanted to give and so she wanted it and she told my mother, you stole my name. You stole something of mine. My mother didn't know what she was talking about soon after I was born. Then she said this thing happened. So then she chose Rajiv and you chose Rajiv as well. She chose Rahul. No, she chose Rahul for her grandson. First Rajiv, Rajiv and then Rajiv son. Rahul. And, then, and you chose yeah. Rajiv for your son. And that was done without consulting anywhere. So there's a real rishta between the Nehru's and the Bajajis. Which Sonia ji also knows about and I think Rahul knows about. So to come back to my question, as I said, you've known every Prime Minister from Jawaharlal Nehru to Narendra Modi. Is there any one that you would say is truly special? You see, now you're asking the first time a question which can get me into trouble if I give a very honest answer. Oh, do, And I don't please. believe and I don't want to and I don't believe in giving a dishonest answer. Now, you might say it's a political answer, and maybe to some extent it is, but I'll tell you this. I'll take three names. There were so many prime ministers, I don't even know 15 or 18 or 12. There's a very decent guy who was, didn't live long enough, was Lal Bahadur Shah. So he's one of them? No. So he's not. Okay. So who are, short, the three? who are the three? Two short. Who are the three? The three are Jawaharlal Nehru, Indira Gandhi, and Narendra Modi. Now, for each, quickly, Nehru, first prime minister, Gandhi made him 
he did many things. He brought India on the world map. NAM, which has lost yeah. all its significance Indira now. Indira Gandhi. But two bad things of the Prime Minister, the, of Nehru. One, Kashmir, and the other, 1962, China, Hindi, Chini, Bhai, Bhai. Two disasters, and I think that killed him. Second, Indira Gandhi, I have no time to go into details. She was a strong lady, and she put us also on international yeah. backup. She fought Nixon and John Ford like Dallas. strong ladies. I like strong ladies. I like strong men also in a different way. But the point, <laughs> I made that clear to you, Karan. <laughs> yeah. Mr. But, Bajaj, you have a wonderfully, delightfully, joyously wicked mind. <laughs> But I love it. Who's the third? Come to Narendra Modi. Nah, so, but she spoiled her whole thing because of either you're with me or, or against me and there's no grey area and the emergency and the wrong influence of Sanjay, Sanjay Gandhi. Uh, so, that was that. Otherwise, she was very long serving also. Now, problem here, the first problem with Narendra Modi is, not a problem but situation, is this two and a half years. And I'm comparing them with one guy, God knows, from 47 to 64. So, then I should ask you, why are you including Narendra Modi with the other two? Good question. Keeping in mind what has happened recently, I can't compare him with Nehru. And the UPA 2, which was a disaster, UPA 1 was not a disaster, UPA 2 was a disaster. Whether it's Colgate, whether it's this scam, whether it's 2G scam, whether it's paralysis in the government, you know that better than me. Uh, I see tremendous potential. There are problems. There are problems. So it's not performance that you give him credit for, but potential. The hope that he will perform. Yes, and better to expect that from him than what the Nobel Prize givers expected from uh, Obama giving him Nobel Prize within a year of becoming president, which was uncalled for. On that basis and on that scale, I know your father's answer. He's a great admirer of Narendra Modi. What about you? How do you think Mr. Modi and the I government has that. performed? Well, you put him in the top three prime ministers. That's fine. I take it you admire the top three. <laughs> We're getting into a very interesting territory where the top three may not be admirable. <laughs> They're the best of a bad bunch. But come back to my question. We leave the audience to ponder over that. Your father's wicked smile is going to have the audience thinking for a long time. <laughs> where do you judge Mr. Modi? He's almost halfway through his term. A lot of industrialists had huge expectations. Mm -hmm. Has he lived up to them? Or are you beginning to feel disappointed? I'm not disappointed at all. I think the problem was in the whole election slogan of Achhe Din Aayenge, people who didn't realize how tough or how tough the economic situation was in the country expected that, okay, three months, six months, you'll start seeing change. People also didn't realize what was happening globally around us, what, and even today, the global economy. Keeping that in mind, we have not seen the growth on ground as what we were expecting as a, if I was a common man. But on the other hand, knowing the kind of change that needs to be driven, knowing the way obsolete rules are being removed, enabling of the rural masses, all the, the insurance schemes, the opening of bank accounts, the way other has been taken forward. I think these are amazing things which will show result in the coming years. I'm going to give you the last word because even if I don't, you'll grab it. Do you see a bright future as most Indians hope and most Indians imagine and most Indians claim lies just across the horizon? Or is the horizon so far away, who knows when we'll get to it? Well, who knows where we get when. Uh, that can be a general statement which will always remain there. But the way you put it, uh, Karan, uh, is almost saying, and which is a fact, we are all, at least I am very much and I'm sure you are, born optimists. This is the first thing. So nobody wants to say, no, 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 this won't happen and all that. So, people when they say everything good is going to happen, you have to take it as a pinch of salt. Having said that, come on, except for some changes in last year or two which Sanjeev was talking about, I'm exaggerating a little bit. We had such potential and we got nowhere in the last 10, 15, 20 years. We were the same in even 1970, mid-70s or early, early 70s as China, Southeast Asia, all those countries. And today where are we? You can't blame the British, that was 47 and earlier, but not after 68 years. So tremendous potential, and now we can only go up. Where will you go down from a per capita income of $1,600? But, but, but the corollary is, if we don't go up with this potential, we have only ourselves to blame. That's what we have ourselves to blame even for the last 68 years. Absolutely. So we can only go up with the entrepreneurship class, with the kind of people, the people are aspiring for tremendous things. I hope you're right, but I'm suddenly reminded that when you say we can only go up, there's another commodity that only goes up, 
hot air balloons. Let's we hope this is not a hot air down. balloon. It should never come down. And uh, we will go up. Uh, and India will go up. On that, will go up. on that note of optimism and that everyone shares, thank you very much for being my guest. Thank you. Today. Thank you.